Life in Accounting, the Where Accountants Go podcast. Life in Accounting is the podcast for everyday heroes like you working in the accounting profession. Are you ready to hear from accounting influencers, thought leaders, visionaries, and other professionals leading change in the accounting world? Then stay tuned for Mark Goldman, a CPA, the owner of Where Accountants Go, and your host. Welcome to Life in Accounting. And they know that we've got it because that license gives them and others, you know, a certain level of comfort that you, you know, that you've got the right skill set and the right experience. Hello, everyone. I'm Mark Goldman, a CPA and your host for Life in Accounting, a podcast production of whereaccountantsgo.com. That clip was from Eric Mack a deputy senior financial officer with the large diversified financial services organization, USAA. This episode covers a lot of territory on several fronts, so to speak. First of all, if you're looking to build your career within large organizations, this will be a tremendous episode for you. Also, if you have been or are in the armed services and will be transitioning into the commercial world, Eric has some good insight to pass on there as well. And as you'll hear him say several times, if you're considering whether or not you should pursue the CPA certification, he definitely has some thoughts on that. Let's just say he's a big believer in the difference it can make. Another quick note before we get started, at the time we are recording this, I have just released my first book, 49 Tips for a Successful Accounting Career. You can find it on Amazon. And if you enjoy the podcast, you will enjoy the book. I've condensed many of the career advice nuggets down into these 49 tips for a successful accounting career so that you can find all the best pieces in one place. Please check it out. And if you do, I'd love to hear any feedback that you have for me. I can be reached at markg at whereaccountantsgo.com. Let's go ahead and get into the interview. Here's Eric Mack, Deputy Senior Financial Officer at USAA. Hello, Eric. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Hi, Mark. Thanks for the invitation. Really, this is a great thing you're doing for the students and the profession. I'm happy to be a part of it. Oh, well, thank you very much. Well, for the audience, we have Eric Mack from USAA on the line with us today. And if you remember back to one of the previous episodes that we recorded, Eric's actually going to be our second guest from USAA. We were fortunate enough to have Doug Ward from their investment side with us on the show earlier this year. But USAA is a very big place, and Eric and Doug definitely have unique backgrounds themselves as well as unique roles there. So this is going to be a treat. I invited Eric on the show for many reasons, obviously to talk about his own career journey from the beginning to moving up within USAA, but also because Eric is a former Marine, and I wanted to delve into that transition as well for the benefit of some of our audience members looking to make similar you know, transitions later on. Eric, I always like to start at the beginning so we get a full picture of how you got to where you are today. What initially led you to think about pursuing accounting as a possible career in the first place? So it's interesting because it hasn't worked out the way I had originally envisioned when I was considering a career path. So I had picked accounting because I was trying to find a profession that ultimately I could be an entrepreneur. I could have my own shop, you know, a small firm and do that work. And as you know, as we'll talk a little bit about where I've ended up, that hasn't worked out, but it's been a, definitely a good career path for me. And I've been able to still use some of those kind of skill sets, but then, you know, in more of a corporate and big four type environment. So. Interesting. So you had an entrepreneurial streak and you figured the accounting would be a good career to, I guess, to have a business in? Yeah. And actually my wife has an accountant as well. I think you might have met her, but she actually had her own practice for a little while, you know, small business consulting, QuickBooks, a little bit of tax work and those types of things. And so I had thought, you know, initially when I was still in in school, first picking this course, I had thought that that was attractive to me to be able to kind of have your own business and kind of build that business. Okay. Now, being in the service, I guess, when did school come in? Did you go through the service first and then school or what order did you do all that in? Sure. Yeah, it was a a long and varied course. So I actually enlisted while I was still in high school and went to, you know, boot camp right out of high school. So I was 17. 
And, you know, I had thought I would do probably one enlistment at that point. You know, it was pretty common for enlistments to be three years unless you had some specialty. But I got in and I really enjoyed it. So I re-enlisted for another, at that point, re-enlisted for four years. But during that second enlistment, I met my wife, who was also in the Marine Corps. And we got married and we decided, well, it just, a lot of people do raise, kind of raise families in that environment. We decided that it really, the deployment pace that I had back then, I didn't want to do that for that phase of my life. And so got off active duty after that second enlistment. So I had about, you know, just under seven years on active duty and stayed in the reserve. So I went straight from active into the reserve and stayed with that for another 14 years. I ended up retiring from the reserve in 2003. So the question, how school fit into that? So while I was on active duty, I was able to take a few classes, but really, you know, not enough to finish a degree. So when I got off active duty, my wife also I got back to you. So we really took turns. So that's another thing. I really didn't have a traditional, at any point in my life, a traditional student path. I was always working during the day and the two of us were taking turns going to class at night and, you know, having our children. So it took a lot longer than I'd like to admit, <laughs> but we got through, got through that process. So. Okay. So, yeah, I hear a lot of people do that with a CPA certification. Obviously, life starts and then they, you're trying to manage that as well as working. But <laughs> you were having to do that management even just to get your bachelor's degree. Okay. I guess what were your roles like while you were in the military and when did you start working in accounting? What was that transition like? So, in the military, I actually, as I, when I was in the reserve, so I progressed from a private, you know, enlisted up through a gunnery sergeant and then I applied for a program for warrant officers, which is in the Marine Corps in particular, it's a little different than a program the Army has. It's a technical specialist. So I was sort of an expert in embarkation and logistics. And so what that really boils down to is, you know, when you're looking at uh, like old World War II movie and they're doing a beach landing, we're the ones who are putting together the plans to say what needs to go on which ship, what order does things need to get to the beach. If we're flying things in with helicopters, you know, we're kind of planning what goes on which helicopter to get it to the beach at the right time. So it's a lot like puzzles. And that was really my specialty throughout. Okay. Okay. What was your first accounting job? So I went into public accounting. And so it was interesting. I think for this audience, there might be some curiosity about the different paths. So when I was in the accounting program, you know, you heard a lot about audit and I had an interest in audit, but the sense I got was, that well, you really had to at least at that point, the thought was there wasn't a lot of opportunity for that if you weren't kind of more of a traditional student career path. And so I started to look about, actually about a year before I was able to graduate and have my hours set for the exam, and I found a job in like two weeks. And so I started with a pretty small firm as an auditor, you know, just a you know, new associate auditor. And yeah, I did that for you know, about a year. I finished my degree and my master's degree, had the hours set for the exam, passed the exam. And then I was fortunate to get on with PricewaterhouseCoopers really right at the time of the merger when the two of them were merging. And again, just transition, it was really kind of lateral transition, you know, new associate at PricewaterhouseCoopers in the audit practice. And, you know, I started out there like a lot of new associates, you're not necessarily very focused on a particular field. So I was in financial services and also some other small businesses. And so pretty varied experience. But right off the bat, I had a one client that was a very large insurance company and I was working on their real estate portfolio, auditing for their real estate portfolio. And I spent, you know, a significant amount of time on that and then everything else was spread out a bunch of smaller, you know, varied entities. And so really pretty early on, I got a taste for doing real estate. And so really from there on my career, well, I did some other things here and there. It was really kind of focused around a real estate track. And then, you know, on the public side, I kind of progressed up through that normal chain, you know, from senior and manager, senior manager, and had about 10 years with PwC when I had decided that I really needed to make a transition to industry. It was really more geographical than anything else. To really progress, I needed to relocate within PwC. And I decided at that point that for you know, personal reasons, I wanted to stay kind of here in Texas and looked around and was fortunate enough to find this, or not this position, but a position here with USAA. Interesting. I have to ask, this insurance company where you worked on their real estate portfolio, was that USAA? It was not. Yeah. So that's, oh, okay. you know, which is interesting, you know, because actually my boss did. He audited USA's real estate company way back when, and that used to be a very common career path where the auditor would go to one of their clients. You know, for me, I actually was in Atlanta at that time, at that phase of my career. And it was that insurance company was acquired and merged and changed names, you know, various times. It was a pretty significant size insurance company there in Atlanta. 
Okay. Well, I just had to ask. I mean, yeah, no, I know okay. USA yeah. has real estate portfolios. So. Right, right. <laughs> just sort of would make sense. Now, for those that aren't from the South Texas area, you know, they may not be as familiar with USAA. I mean, could you tell us a little bit about USA and then I guess what area you work in exactly now? Sure. So USAA is a really diversified financial services company. And so it has insurance was really the root, the initial, the original business was property and casualty, you know, auto insurance, but it's expanded into, you know, life insurance, banking, investment products. You mentioned Doug Ward was on our order. He manages a lot of the investment portfolio for the company. And one of those investments is real estate. And that's where I kind of come in. So USA is, again, you know, the first five financial services company, but it's got a mission where it's tied to support the military and the extended military family. And so that really is significant because it gives a focus to the organization where when we're doing things, it's the thought of what can we do to better serve kind of the military. And, and so it's member owned, you know, the members own the company. As of the end of last year, we were about 12 and a half million members. Got about 33,000 employees, so a sizable organization supporting that military community. I mentioned one of the investment types that we have is real estate, and that's where I come in. Similar to my, actually, my first real estate client that we were talking about a second ago, you know, a lot of insurance companies have an investment allocation to real estate, and they can do that different ways, but usually when they get to a certain size, they actually create a real estate department, entity, some sort of an organization to do their own real estate investment. And so that's where I am. So the insurance company created the real estate company to manage their real estate investments. I'm the deputy senior financial officer for the real estate company. And we're basically managing our parents' investments in real estate. But we also have other investors who are similar, have similar goals, other pension plans, other insurance companies, and we'll manage their real estate investments as well. Okay. I'm curious, you've been there close to 10 years, right? That, yes. Okay. What kind of role did you start out in? Sure. Yeah. So I started off as a technical accounting manager director. I can't remember the exact title, but I was sort of the, the single person <laughs> to do kind of the technical accounting. In my experience, that's a fairly common transition for somebody from a, I was a senior manager on the audit side. And so I think at that level, kind of a technical accounting or some sort of SEC reporting or something like that, it tends to be that bridge to get into an industry role. So start off with their technical accounting here. <laughs> Keep thinking, well, sooner or later things will calm down, but it seems like there's always something changing in the accounting guidance. And so that really is a pretty significant job. Today we have you know, a senior director in that group and a couple of people full time. And so part of it is new accounting pronouncements and how those are impacting us in the industry. But also we're very, as real estate, we're very transaction driven. We're constantly acquiring things, disposing of things, setting up new funds, new joint ventures. And so there are a lot of accounting implications for that. How do you account for those investments? And so it's a pretty significant part of our business and it lines up with my background and my interests. I really enjoy kind of that transaction driven nature of the business. Okay. Okay. Did you go directly from that technical accounting manager role to this deputy role or did you move around quite a bit internally? Or? Yeah. So I moved a little bit internally. I So the technical accounting group that I was doing was really supporting our portfolio accounting team, which is really where all investments are housed, as well as our corporate accounting team. And so I moved from that to oversee our portfolio accounting team. So that's where all of our fund accounting and our investment property level accounting rolls up into that portfolio accounting team. And again, it, and I think this is fairly common in our industry to get a flavor. So we have this year, we had about 35 fund audits that were within that group. And, you know, that's about 300 plus kind of properties and various structures that roll up through that. So it's a, you know, a pretty sizable group. And then after a couple of years there, we had a role that was accounting, just the accounting officer. And there I sort of still had that group, but I also started to oversee our corporate accounting group. And then the next step from that accounting officer level was to this deputy chief financial officer. And there I still do a lot of those same things that is accounting officer uh, really didn't kind of replace that role. It was really more of a transition of that role, but also taking on a little bit more of the finance, kind of backing up our senior financial officer, which is the term we use here for basically our company CFO. And so I'm, I back him up on a lot of things that are more parent related, you know, facing our parent or some of those types of things. Okay. Okay. 
don't know the right way to ask this. So, you know, if I'm a younger individual listening to this podcast and I want to make my career in larger organizations, I mean, USA, 33,000 employees, I think that would qualify. <laughs> what do you feel are some of the keys to being successful and progressing in a large organization like that? Or what advice would you have for me? You know, what skills are important? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things we have to touch on at least once or twice or maybe a dozen times is a CPA license. Okay. And I think that's really critical. And, you know, somebody could look at it and say, well, you're in industry or really don't need a CPA license. And I've, I've met many people throughout my career who haven't, but it, it's really, I think, a very valuable step to take uh, for a lot of reasons. But one is, you know, the for us in particular, the real estate group, I mentioned we manage investments for a lot of people, right? And so early on, and when we have a new investor early on, you know, they'll usually want to talk to us. These are sizable, you know, pension plans, large insurance companies, and they'll want to know about our team, right? And we'll go ahead and we'll say, well, here's our ratio of CPAs to the rest of our accounting team and the level of professionalism there and the continuing professional education that we do and we sponsor. And that's a really short discussion. You know, they kind of check the box and they know that we've got it because that license gives them and others, you know, a certain level of comfort that you've got the right skill set and the right experience and the right continuing education to be able to do a good job. And so it allows you to kind of take that for granted. And so that's my advice a lot of times with new people. You need to develop those technical skills. You need to be really be able to do the accounting, you know, understand the debits and credits. But that's really, I think in most organizations, certainly in ours, that's only going to get you so far. And then what gets to be more and more important are your, you'll hear various terms for it, soft skills, emotional intelligence, but it's really those people skills, right? And being able to communicate well, to interact well, work on teams. And so the technical is just sort of a you know, a minimum, you know, kind of expectation that you have the kind of technical skills. And so I really encourage people, you know, not to not focus on those. You need to do those. But as soon as you have your hands on those, you really need to think about some more of these soft skills and how do you develop those. Yeah, one of my previous guests described it as table stakes, you know, the yes. technical skills. <laughs> yeah, that's a great way to put it. And and so actually here, you know, with my part of USA, so our real estate company, we have about 60 accountants in my team. You really have to be a CPA to be a manager or above. And so we really put a lot of stock in that. And I think there are a lot of other organizations who do. And I think particularly where it's really helpful, if somebody happens to be in an organization where they don't perceive that value internally. And then something, for whatever reason down the road, happens where they need to change organization. It can make a huge difference there because it's really, like you were saying, table stakes for a lot of positions. And so I just can't encourage people enough to go ahead and take that next step. If you're getting your degree, take that next step and go ahead and take the exam and, and get your license. So Definitely. What do you enjoy the most about what you do now in your deputy role? And, yeah. yeah. You know, I really... I still really like working on transactions, you know, and working with the attorneys and the joint venture partners and the deal guys. And, and I really enjoy that part of it. I also like working a lot with people. I like coaching and teaching. I think it's really important as a profession. That's how, you know, when most of us look back, that's how we learn most of what we know, right? It's because of coaching. It's, a certain amount of it is academic that you took from school, but a lot of it is on the job experience in coaching. So I enjoy doing that. And fortunately, I get to do both. I keep feeling like I need to do less transaction and more of the other, but I'm fortunate enough to be able to keep my hands in both pieces right now. That gives you a little more variety as well. It yeah. does. Yeah, it does. yeah. Makes the days a little more interesting that way. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know if this was an issue for you or not, but I did want to ask about it because actually it had come up with a, a student several months ago when I was at an event, they had asked this question and then also a, a former podcast guest. And going back in your story a little bit, when you were transitioning out of working for the military, you know, during the day, active duty to, you know, getting your first commercial <laughs> you know, uh, for-profit kind of role, was that transition hard for you in any way? Or, you know, is there anything that you, you had to work on to make it successful? Any advice you have? Because I know the two worlds are yeah. different, you know? Yeah, they are. But I've been fortunate in that I've worked with organizations who really have supported that. You know, I, I was already retired from the military before I came here. But here, when we have people who obviously were very tied in the military here. So I've been fortunate coming in that there wasn't 
some sort of lack of understanding. You know, there's a good understanding of what the military is and people. And so I think that's probably important. There might be some organizations where they just aren't as aware. And so then sometimes that makes it a little bit hard to translate experience. But I think the other side of that is, let's say that, you know, you've got somebody who's, you know, you know, six, eight years of experience in the military and now or more, right, in their transition to a new career, you obviously have a lot of experience in what you were doing in the military. And a lot of that has a good general application, right? Leadership skills, work ethic, you know, just general life skills, right? A lot of that has a lot of real value. But what I realized, I acknowledge was, but I've never audited anything. Right? And so <laughs> I came into it with the mindset that I am starting over, right? This is a transition to a new career. And I came into it with that. I think if somebody, and at the same time, you know, those other things that I mentioned have been extremely valuable, right? Because I think when I was in public accounting, I progressed, I think, much faster than I would have if I didn't have those other skills. One, because I wasn't having to focus on those things, right? I already knew that thing. I could focus on auditing, right? That's the part that was new. And so I think it helped accelerate that a little bit. And a lot of those skills, again, are really valuable, particularly where they line up with, again, the kind of the organization you're with today. So like, for example, you know, the Marine Corps in particular has sort of a servant leadership mentality, right? And so I view a significant amount of my job and my responsibility is to make sure that my team is successful, right? And how can I make them successful? You know, in the military, that translates in that, you know, the troops eat first kind of a mentality, right? Well, that's the same really view that USAA has, is really this kind of leadership, servant leadership type philosophy. So it helps with that transition, but it's not like you can say, well, you know, I had six years of military experience, so that's equivalent to X as an auditor, right? Because it's just such a technical skill as opposed to somebody who is maybe transitioning into some more general kind of management type role. Okay. That's good advice. Find the right company in the first place that's supportive, Mm -hmm. and then you need to have an open mindset about, you know, the fact that you're learning something new. <laughs> right, right. And I think that's true, you know, even within the accounting is, you know, there, as you know, Mark, and I probably others on, there are a lot of different career paths within accounting. And sometimes you reach these branches where you're changing. You say, well, okay, this is the path I was on. Like, for example, for me, for auditing. So I was at a fairly senior level, you know, kind of in the audit structure. And so, yeah, I could have said, well, you know, based on that, I need to come in at, you know, an executive director level or whatever the appropriate level was. But to be able to just take that, I'm going to say that experience is going to pay off. I just, I know what I want to do and I want to get into that position, but not be hung up on, am I getting kind of an equivalent title or anything? Just get into the position where you're doing the role that you want to do and you're getting the experience that you want to get and then trust yeah, that this other general experience is maybe going to help you accelerate again because of focus and some of those, those types of things. Be coachable and be humble, right? <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. You know, and then, you know, I don't know, just thinking about advice. So I know the one, like I say, we'll want to say at least a dozen times, get your CPA license. You know, another thing that I've noticed, which I have found unusual, I've seen it come up occasionally in industry, was I've run into people at various stages of their career where they think they're at the point where they want to take the next step. So maybe they're at a senior associate level and they want to be a manager. And they're saying, well, you know, when I'm a manager, here's what I'll do, right? And I know me as a leader, and I think most of the people I work with and they're successful, that's not what we're looking for, right? We want people to start doing the job, right? And so somebody taking that initiative to, if they want to be a manager and they're at the next level, they're going to their manager to say, what can I take off your plate? How can I take something off of your plate? And showing that initiative and not saying, well, that's really a manager's job. And so I don't want to go there. And it's, you know, it's not a widespread, but just there is a certain amount of the workforce who says, you know, I'm kind of at this level and this is my job. And, you know, when I'm promoted, then I'll do more, right? And I would say, in a lot of companies, that's not going to be the yeah you know, the best track to progress, particularly into kind of the manager or executive level. That's good, tough love advice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the more you can take on. I mean, if you're wanting to progress, you know, the more you can take on, and the more I can take off of my boss's plate, the better that is for him, the better it is for me, and then you know, I'm looking for my uh, team to do the same. It's how we develop, kind of back to that almost an apprenticeship type profession, right? That that's how we learn is by taking on more and getting coaching and, and developing. So. There you go. Well, I end every podcast with the same three questions and I want to make sure I'm respectful of your time. One last question before we get to that though, because we're talking about you know general career advice. 
If you could go back in time and give your younger self just one piece of critical advice, what do you think that might be? So I think, you know, I mentioned just that my career path probably wasn't as straight, as straight of a line as a lot of people. And so I think there were periods where before I had finished my degree and had started in the audit world, probably some points where I could have accelerated that a little bit, but I just didn't keep as much of a focus on kind of getting through the degree and getting the line. And so I think that, yeah, just kind of trying to continually maintain that focus. Yeah, focus. <laughs> yeah. Particularly at a younger age is very, very yeah. important. <laughs> I think we yeah. I think we all feel that way. <laughs> yeah. I mean you start getting comfortable with something, right? And then life gets in the way. I think I've heard you kind of mention that before. You know, one of the places in accounting where that shows up often is in the CPA exam. I don't know if we're up to a dozen times yet, but <laughs> one more plug for it. <laughs> you do have people who say, Yeah, I want to go ahead and sit for the exam. But they've now graduated from college. They've started at a, you know, in public accounting or industry or whatever. And they're focused on their job. And then, you know, they're happy to not be, you know, in class all the time. And so they're focused on their life. And before you know it, it's a couple of years down the road and it gets to be, you know, much more difficult. You know, it's, it's really an academic test. And so the sooner you can take that after you graduate, the better. And I think some people get into their career and they think, well, when I get to that next level, I'll have more time. And it's usually not the case. Usually, especially early in your career, the more as you're progressing, you're actually I don't want to depress anybody. You actually usually taking on more, right? And you're learning. And so the earlier you can get that done, get it out of the way, you know, the better. And it'll allow you to then kind of focus on other parts of your career and family and those types of things. Definitely. Well, I do end every podcast with the same three questions, like I mentioned. And so mm-hmm. getting to that, the first one's usually the easiest for people. Mm-hmm. Career wise, what's been your proudest moment? Yeah. So I was working in the audit field for actually another insurance company. I'm related to the two. It's just a you know, big part of my career is working on insurance companies, real estate portfolios. But I was working for one during the 2008, 2009, you know, the great financial crisis, the GFC. And it was really a stressful time in the industry. And the client that I had was really trying to look at a lot of different options and different alternatives for how they could manage their way through that crisis. And it led to, you know, tremendous amount of work for my team. And so I think that as we worked through that, I was just really, really proud that we were able to kind of pull the resources we needed together to be able to provide them the information they needed so that then they could make the really, you know, make informed decision choices, had the, you know, as many options as were viable they were kind of working through that you know, it was a lot of work but i think that's what you find a lot of times is people when they get through things like that you just feel you know a big sense of satisfaction that you've been able to kind of get through that and help you know your client or your firm your company depending on what your role is definitely yeah i'm sure that was a stressful time for <laughs> yeah. everybody at that point mm-hmm. well second question Tell us about a mistake you've made and what you learned from it, of course, and that's what we're really after. But the bigger, the better. We we like the colossal, (laughs) huge, ugly kind of mistakes. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So I'm sure there are many to pick from. (laughs) But one that sticks in your mind, and that's the ones that really you you do kind of learn from, was you know fairly early on in my career, I had been asked to do a, a project that was sort of an unusual. So I was in audit, and this wasn't really necessarily an audit role. It was a little bit more of what today would probably fall into sort of a forensic type role. And it's it's one of those things that it's a little bit harder than to predict what needs to be done and how long it's going to take. And it turned into a much bigger project than I think anybody involved in it had anticipated. And I really, in hindsight, I really should have done a better job of communicating that as I went through. And that's one of the things I was talk with you know, newer employees, you know, if you get into something and it's taking longer than you think, don't spin your wheels, right? And so it wasn't so much I felt like I was spinning my wheels, but I just felt like I needed, I should have gone back earlier to say, hey, you know, this is the direction this is headed. Is this what you were expecting? Is there advice? Am I off track? And a little bit more frequent check-in kind of early in. It ended up being, again, a very, you know, a much larger project and, you know, more resources than originally, you know, kind of contemplated. So, well. I'm sure there were some good lessons that came out of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's just to communicate early and, and, you know, if you see 
So part of that communication is making sure you have an expectation. You know, so I'll kind of translate that into a more traditional kind of audit role, right? That if somebody says, okay, well, I want you to go audit cash for this entity. Okay, great. Um, how long do you think that's going to take, right? Ask the person, you know, how long do you think that'll take me or, or how long should that take or how much time is budgeted for that or something like that, just so that you have a framework, right? And then if you start working on it, you can say, you know what, this doesn't, feel right. Either it's not taking me nearly as much time as they thought, which means maybe I'm doing everything I should, <laughs> or this is going to take much longer, right? And so I think that frequent communication, particularly when you're doing anything that's kind of you know less common, kind of unusual, just to make sure that everybody is aligned on it. Mm, that is a good lesson, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Asking mm-hmm. about the expectations in advance. That's smart. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, final question, and then we'll go ahead and close it down. What is the best piece of advice that you have ever received? Yeah, so I think, you know, what I would always lean to is to take care of your team, right? And it's just, that's kind of what's been my experience and the leaders that I've worked with and what I've tried to emulate inside that servant leadership is I think if you do that, particularly in accounting, I mean, that's all yeah, that's what we are, right? You know, we're not making widgets or anything. It's, it's really, how are we as a profession? And so I think that taking care of, you know, your team and your profession, you know, to help them develop as professionals. And so I had that from my leaders and I've tried to also kind of pass that on to my team through my career. Sign of a good manager, for sure. Definitely. Well, thank you very much, Eric. That really is great advice to end this on, particularly those that are, that are looking to advance. So thank you very much. Sure. Thanks, Mark. Well, for our audience, this has been Life in Accounting, a podcast production of whereaccountantsgo.com. If you haven't yet visited that website, please do so. We're going to have the show notes for Eric's episode and, of course, all the other episodes that we've produced in this last two years. That website, once again, is whereaccountantsgo.com. Dot com And not just because of this episode, but we always do this. We have links to the accounting certifications, including review courses that you may want to consider for the CPA exam as well. Once again, that's whereaccountsgo.com. On that note, Eric, any final thoughts that you'd like to leave the audience with? Sure. Yeah, I would just encourage everybody to really take advantage of that resource because I think it is challenging when you're still in school to understand what are all the different career paths because they're varied that you can take you know with an accounting degree and it's a great you know a great resource to really just see what other career paths people have had and pick up on ideas hopefully a few of those will ring true to you beautiful well thank you very much (laughs) well thank you to the audience for joining us once again we will see everyone next week there's more to come